then? Or just wait for a... Yeah, I think we should just start, yeah. Before... All right, all right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, in, in these interesting and uncertain times. Uh, but my name is Rahul Mangharam, and uh, I'm a faculty member at the uh, University of Pennsylvania's Electrical and Systems Engineering Department and Computer Science Department. Uh, we've been uh, long-term collaborators uh, with uh, Intel Labs and with Nagin's group on uh, wireless uh, autonomous mm. systems, where we have uh, Intel Science and Technology Center. And this is one of the uh, recent efforts uh, today that we'll talk about in sort of automating, you know, the design and testing of autonomous systems. And so in today's talk, uh, Hong Rui Zeng, who is uh, also known as Billy, Billy will talk to us uh, about some of the recent work uh, on how do we have scalable and effective testing of, you know, uh, perception, planning, control, machine learning uh, components in autonomous systems for physical systems, right? So we'll specifically look at uh, problems in autonomous vehicles. And uh, so Billy will present uh, one of the uh, tool chains that developed for uh, uh, optimizing, you know, autonomous uh, vehicles in the context of autonomous racing. Uh, as you know, at Penn, uh, we have this F110 project. Uh, you see the logo at the bottom there. Uh, and that is a one-tenth scale Formula One racing cars, which we use as data gathering and validation platforms for developing these autonomous vehicles. Uh, so over to you, Billy. We can get started. And then please, uh, whoever have questions, you know, feel free to interrupt us at any time. Okay. Thank you, Rahul. Um, hi, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah, we're good. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So today we're going to talk about a recent development um, in automating design and testing of autonomous systems. Um, specifically, we're talking about um, dealing with some of these challenges that we see in autonomous, autonomous vehicle testing. Um, so first of all, autonomous, autonomous vehicles sometimes encounter uh, infinite number of different scenarios. So basically you can have different scenarios and you can combine them, making them into a new scenario. Um, constructing these scenarios are very costly, both in time and manpower. Um, and also manually constructed testing scenarios are not exhaustive and can't guarantee covering all possible scenarios than uh, an autonomous vehicle could encounter in development. So, um, what we see in recent trend is that people or uh, in academia are trying to auto automatically construct these scenarios and it's a very hard problem. So this makes uh, AV testing basically very difficult and the tests we do are limited. Um, so another challenge is that uh, in all these scenarios when uh, autonomous vehicles encounter unique scenarios that was not seen in simulation, um, <clears throat> testing these scenarios with a prototype is impractical, right? Basically, if we have an on-road prototype that uh, rarely see these conditions uh, and we want to set up a scenario specifically for this, these conditions are very dangerous and costly. And lastly, uh, human errors. Uh, from this picture here, uh, as you all know, the Uber incident, where it, it was basically introduced by, it was caused by human errors. And as we all know, as you uh, increase the sample space of your testing, um, human errors are inevitable, right? Testing could lead to endangerment of even human life and uh, usually expensive equipment. Um, so this makes autonomous vehicle testing very dangerous where a small error could sometimes lead to a catastrophe. All right, so why do we want to narrow this problem of uh, automating the design and testing down to um, autonomous racing? Um, first of all, so, so you have this quote here by, I think, Mario Andretti. Uh, if everything seems under control, then you're not going fast enough. Um, racing as an extreme sport, it pushes autonomous vehicles to the limits of their performance. Um, where a small mistake by uh, 
your autonomous racer in 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 in, the, in, in this uh, choice to perform um, some strategy or a small bug in your software stack um, could lead to at least suboptimal performance and sometimes a big crash. And racing also gives autonomous vehicles a very focused task with clear measure of performance. Um, so, for example, for a time trial where we uh, run the competitions on, um, the measure of quality is basically the lap time that you can get on a given track. Um, we also run head-to-head -head racing in uh, in our recent races. So, basically, the uh, measure of quality is basically if you can uh, finish, uh, say, like two laps before your opponent does, right? So balancing between safety and performance is very crucial for autonomous racing. Uh, and in contrast, civilian driving does not explore achieving this uh, balance because in everyday driving, we just want to shoot for uh, maximum safety and maybe sometimes maximum com uh, comfort for the passenger. And uh, the definition of research progress uh, in civilian driving is less clear, and the research problems are very difficult to address. Um, and the next point I want to make is that autonomous racing also provides us with an adversarial environment, right, where the other agent in the same environment's objective is very clear, um, and the goal of them is to impede the eagle agent's progress. Yeah, as we can see here, the, the, the other car is trying to overtake us and sometimes even try to block us on a racing line to slow us down. Um, meanwhile, civilian driving scenarios are usually a combination of uh, collaborative, cooperative, um, and adversarial environments all in one, where um, if you want to predict the other agent's intent, it's very hard, and it's a hard research problem to address. And lastly, uh, we want to do research in racing because of the trickle-down effect. Um, so basically, uh, for example, in F1, the development of uh, race car engines uh, leads to uh, better uh, power output, better fuel efficiency of uh, your consumer vehicles, and also it leads to better aerodynamics for even more fuel efficiency. Um, and, for example, in rally racing, maybe um, the develop, development of rally race cars will lead to a better suspension system in consumer vehicles. Um, so that's why we want to develop at the forefront of driving, um, which could potentially be beneficial for the development and massive deployment of autonomous vehicles in the future. Uh, and the research platform that we use to address these research problems is the F110 platform. Um, so as Rahul introduced uh, before, we're trying to expedite the research progress in autonomous systems um, by providing a common hardware platform and some very interesting benchmarking, benchmarking tasks that everybody's uh, working on. Right? We're hoping to accelerate the research um, in uh, these areas, but not limited to these areas, such as um, autonomous systems, machine learning, reinforcement learning, um, and control. And moreover, we hope that with this platform, we can uh, make conducting research on hardware easier. So a little bit about the platform that we're using. Um, the F110 system consists of uh, the hardware component. Uh, it consists of like a chassis, which is a 110 scale off-the-shelf RC car. Um, we also have open source design uh, on the power management board and the electronic speed controllers, uh, which is great for uh, the hacker hacker culture where people want to use our component for uh, use our component or the car for other purposes. Right? The mm -hmm. sensors on board for perception are uh, for our own purpose. We usually use lidars and cameras. Um, for, uh, uh, as we've seen in other labs, they're even uh, pushing the boundaries on what sensors you can use on these um, on these systems. So, so for example, one team at Penn is trying to use the, uh, the event-based cameras, which is not still not a commodity hardware these days. On uh, trying to do research on the same platform. Uh, and lastly, we provide an open-source software stack 
where it's very easy to explore all components of this, uh, autonomous systems where basically we provide you with a basic driving stack and the com compute unit on board is capable of doing uh, accelerated libraries on the GPU so you can develop your own uh, algorithm on top of the basic driver stack. Right, and we also host, um, we also provide a common benchmark by hosting annual races um, where the race format is fixed. So uh, recently we switched to having two formats where uh, you could either do uh, time trials where it's a one car racing and you go around the track as fast as possible. And we also have two car racing where two teams will do head to head racing um, and see who the winner is. And we have brackets to find the final winner. Um, so the, the environment is the same for all the teams, and we don't tell any of the teams beforehand what the map is going to look like. Um, so they have to adapt to different environments for the same objective. Um, also, there's a great community support for the project. Um, if there are any questions on the subjects that uh, as a, the development team cannot answer, as in a, we're not experts in, um, there's also a large research community um, that has experts in many different areas that can help. Uh, for example, this is a video of the race that we recently ran uh, in New York City in Colombia. Uh, may I ask you a question? Uh, was there a question? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what's included in your starter kit? Uh, so the starter kit, uh, we have the we have basically the open source design um, of the whole vehicle. So we're currently uh, updating our build manual uh, these few weeks because we're online now. So it has the it has a BOM which shows you all the components or the base components that you can buy. We provide uh, links and we have a price for that. Um, the power board, you can buy the PCB from uh, like Osh Park and you can solder your own with uh, components from like DigiKey. Um, so basically the base configuration has um, this hardware, this uh, chassis platform here and there's a top plate that's laser cut where all the uh, TX2, uh, this is a, basically the Jetson system, uh, the, the uh, uh, ESC and the power board and the perception unit. Uh, so the base one only has a 10 meter planar LIDAR. So that's what comes with the starter kit. And we also have a few uh, basic, uh, basically the driving software that can get you started with. Thank you. All right. Also, I think we have yeah, just, one in the lab. Just, uh, yeah, I think, uh, it, mm -hmm. yeah, Intel labs, have a couple of these cars. Also, we have a full full blown course, online course, for uh, starting from uh, you know for a whole semester long, from perception, planning, control to learning to computer vision, and we cover all of these topics uh, within that course. And everything is uh, is online, and I can share the link with Nagin. But most of that information you can get on f110s.org, and uh, we'd be happy to help. Uh, you know chat with anybody at Intel Labs. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Try to this forward. So as you can see, this is a race that we ran and we have, uh, I think around 15 teams this time. Yeah, and I guess while this is playing, I, I, I see very jagged frames here, but um, the essential idea is that with every race, every all the teams have the same car, so it's a battle of algorithms. And with every race, uh, they release the algorithms used in the previous races, so there is almost like an exponential 
improvement in the performance and in the type of algorithms that are being used. And this includes like from SLAM to visual inertia odometry, all the kind of research that people are doing, it, it, it all runs on this kind of platform. But I think, uh, Billy, you can go ahead after. Okay. All right, so um, next we're gonna go in depth. Um, so that was all the background information for this research project. Um, and next I'll present a project that we recent, recently submitted to ICRA, we're calling it Tunicar. Um, so basically this is super optimization for autonomous racing. Um, so the goal of this project was to optimize for maximum maximum performance for a given race car on a given racetrack, um, where we also want to bridge the gap between simulation, um, basically the one you see on the left, where the lap time is slowly improving, and we want to bridge the gap and transfer the same policy that we find in simulation and put it on the real car, as you can see uh, on the right here. Um, so a little bit of background on how we got motivated to start working on this project. Uh, basically tuning of these uh, uh, autonomous race car is a problem that we see very often in our um, annual F110 racing events. Um, so tuning these race cars for a new track is slow, it's inexact, and the participants usually spend days going through trial and error to find a good configuration of software and hardware to get a good performance. Right. So um, expert participants usually spend a few hours um, to map the environment because they haven't seen it before. Um, and then they spend more time, sometimes overnight, and uh, even an extra day to tune and update their racing strategy. Um, so during these tuning, uh, tuning rollouts, basically they change their um, PID gains on their controller, they change their planning and control components uh, until they, uh, their car is performing better in the race. But this, is, this comes very, at a very expensive cost as we see in all the previous races that teams would go way too aggressive and then crash their car and ended up with uh, no car for their uh, final race. Right. And lastly, sometimes even the, the vehicle's physical characteristics are, uh, are adjusted. So basically the cars you see are not toys, right? They're a very accurate re representation of a actual uh, autonomous vehicle. You can adjust the stiffness on the suspension spring by using different springs, or you, sh uh, you can adjust the height, the right height of the car, right? Teams uh, sometimes even adjust the weight balance. Um, and even the toe and camber of the front steering wheels, because um, the cars have uh, actual Ackerman steering. And this whole problem of slow and inexact tuning motivated us to create a tool chain where all these parameters are optimized and tested automatically. All right, so a little bit about the problem. So what are the issues? Um, the first of all, there's just way too many knobs to turn. Right, so th this autonomous racing problem is basically a subset of problem where um, you have a very clear objective function that you want to uh, that you want to either maximize or minimize, um, and you have sometimes thousands up to ten thousands of parameters that you can tune. Um, so it's just way too many knobs to turn by hand uh, or tune by um, even experts which brings us to the second point where traditionally these tuning are done by experts by hand, which is not ideal. Um, for example, uh, a postdoc uh, in our lab is working on a problem. Uh, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a research engineer from Hyundai and basically he's trying to um, come up with a new approach where they tune the balance for an uh, engine unit where they want to find a good power output while maintaining uh, a, a required uh, fuel efficiency, basically. And he said um, there are around up to like 10,000 of parameters that you have to tune. And uh, in Hun at Hyundai, basically what they are still doing by uh, to like to, to this day, it's, they're still tuning. Um, the, this tuning is still done by expert engineer with uh, apprentice engineers, which is seems uh, 
it's a, it's a lot it's a little outdated um and then last uh the next point is that the experiments are usually very expensive to run very slow to run and the stakes are just uh, way too high um so sometimes rollout of these experiments um are very time consuming and dangerous in the sense that a failure could be catastrophic and the device might just be destroyed during the experiment. So we don't want to risk uh, losing our whole system for a single rollout. All right, which brings us to simulation, which is a tool that everybody uses to try to, uh, try to alleviate this problem, but sometimes the simulation uh, is not scalable. Right? For example, uh, the engine problem that we talked about earlier in, the, in point two, uh, the, 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 the simulator that they developed was in Simulink uh, in MATLAB, which is really hard to, it's possible, but not easily scalable. Um, so one of the contribution of this work is that we, um, we created a simulator with uh, a dynamic model that's accurate enough that we uh, will also talk about uh, how big the reality gap is in the results section. Um, basically, what we what we chose to do was to implement it with the very popular uh, OpenAI Gym uh, APIs, which is in Python. Uh, the backend is in C++, which makes it still very fast. And the API is in Python, which is friendly to um, a lot of the machine learning or reinforcement learning community, where it's also very easily scalable. So just one uh, clarification. Um, you seem to be implying that the design of the car is also something that you're optimizing for, not just the autonomous driving components of it. Is that yeah? So not the not the big part of the design. Say like the we're modifying the basically the weight distribution of the car uh, and the the uh, overall mass of the car, and I think the uh, front and rear cornering stiffness. So it's parameters that you can actually tune on the car and not like a structural design of the car. Okay. Okay. Um, and continuing the issue section, um, so we have these types of problem. One, one uh, question. Uh, your open gym is uh, how, uh, uh, are you aware of uh, Kala? Simulator Intel has an open source software. Uh, uh, um, Rahul yeah. knows about that and uh, how that is compared with the Open Gym. Uh, what are the so, features available? And uh, yeah. Um, so the the basically Carla and I think AirSim will require a, basically a graphics engine such as Unreal um, to run the simulation. Uh, it's a little bit too high fidelity for our problem because we on on these cars the research problem we're looking at right now mostly uses a planar lidar which is Carla is kind of like an overkill for us which uh, if we use Carla for this problem we're basically wasting resources on uh, rendering the images um, so another version of the simulator uh, right, back to the open AI, sorry back to the open AI gym version of the simulator that we have. We basically have 2D physics. Um, it's not multi-body like in Carla where the whole car is uh, operating in the 3D world. So a big assumption that we're making here is that our racing problem usually happens on the same plane or there's a very little deviation in the z-axis where we can, uh, the, the 2D physics is sufficient enough to cover um, most of these possible outcomes that the car uh, could see, right? So we're kind of sacrificing the fidelity for, for scalability and the speed of the simulation here. Um, so a future direction that we're taking right now is to um, plug into the Unreal rendering backend where um, you're still stepping the 2D physics, which is uh, deterministic, um, and then you're requesting a rendering of say a camera image from Unreal, so in the end you'll you'll have an OpenAI gym that can uh, step the car physics and also provide you with a 2D image that's already rendered instead of uh, simulating the whole environment and the physics interaction between the car and the environment. 
Does that answer your question? Uh, yep, yep, thank you, yeah. Um, I think we can have um, more discussion offline. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, so the, the, this work is also uh, motivated by uh, the, these types of problem, usually within research of machine learning or reinforcement learning, where we see there are hardware components but it's very specific to a pre-configured environment uh, and a hardware platform. Uh, for example, for all the ARM type problems that we see in reinforcement learning these days, um, the ARMs are so good because they're tuned extremely well for, um, so basically the algorithm sometimes only work on that single ARM. It won't work, say, if you change out the hardware or even a slight change in the environment. So we want to create um, Sorry. Uh, basically, we want to create safe and re reusable core autonomy components, right? namely uh, the vehicle and environment agnostic planning and control software. Right? As you can see, like uh, it's the 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 planning stack should still perform the same no matter what environment you're in and what vehicle hardware that you're using. Um, also, racing in this context is a mechanism to create. A competitive environment where the quality of the chosen vehicle configuration has a very clear measure of quality. Right? For example, in the tuna car, the tuna car project space, uh, the case it's the lap time that you go around the track. Um, racing conditions are also uh, very frat, uh, very brittle. Basically, uh, it severely punishes suboptimal vehicle configuration. Right. Um, while nominal conditions may be handled even with poorly integrated components, um, the racing, racing conditions, on the other hand, if you have a, a suboptimal racing strategy, um, such as the path and speed selection and controller parameters, you're going you're gonna to achieve uh, suboptimal results. Um, so why is this important? Uh, there are several points that I think think we uh, Tunicar can potentially address. Um, first of all, is it drastically saves money and time spent on tuning a high dimensional system. Right? Each run of the tool chain on the new track doesn't require any supervision. Basically, what I do is I start the simulation and the searching, uh, the parameter searching optimization, and then I leave it running. I don't need to make sure that uh, the experiments are, are uh, failing or don't, don't require experta experimentation on real hardware during the tuning process. So basically, what tuning card does is it searches for good parameters all in simulation, and once you're done, we transfer to the real hardware. Um, it's also an effort to bridge the gap between uh, some of the new novel approaches proposed from uh, the machine learning and reinforcement learning community and try to bridge the gap between those and real hardware. Um, so for example, TutorCar utilizes a black box optimization process that is also gradient free. Um, it's used recently regained popularity because it's being used to search for weights of a neural network, which is a really high dimensional space. Right. Um, also, the extreme testing of autonomous racing problem will uh, push the uh, planning and control algorithms to the edge of their performance where safety is very crucial um, so we can allow us to, uh, so that allows us to test for robustness and safety of uh, a given control uh, and planning stack okay. and lastly so, uh, clarification question so we I mean of course there is this whole uh, uh, drone environment where we also do you know a lot of testing before we actually mm. move the algorithm to hardware so mm. in these solutions versus you know the drone based solutions the main difference is this hardware model and the dynamics of the car or it's fundamentally different I believe so it's only different in terms of uh, um, the hardware model and mm. also your control stack um, basically, if your control algorithm has parameters that we could tune, uh, like a tens, maybe. So in this case, we only had three. Mm -hmm. um, it, 
I think even up to like a hundred parameters that you can tune, which drastically will drastically change the behavior of the vehicle, and it covers a lot of the possible behaviors of a of autonomous vehicle. It, I think it's still viable with our tool chain. The other question is the the bridging the gap with machine learning. Uh, you mean you mean to say that um, the tuning that you do require uh, uses machine learning algorithms? Is that what you mean or no? Uh, so it, it it is essentially a reinforcement learning approach. Um, so basically, we're we're searching for so 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 it's kind of like a. So they use this approach to search for weights of the neural network instead of doing a gradient descent. Um, so we tried this approach to basically uh, perform rollouts with a sampled set of parameters. So, uh, and then we do this iterative process until the uh, it converges onto a single solution in this case. So it's... I mean, this is more for the, the, the greater goal of F110, I think, because we're the, the point is that we're providing a, a common hardware and common benchmark where, uh, you know, everybody could test um, the performance on the same benchmark, which we know is very beneficial. Like uh, ImageNet has great, greatly boosted the, the uh, computer vision community, I think, in, in the early days. And then now the autonomous vehicle community has all these uh, benchmarks like the Carla ones, um, which also helps everybody to have the same benchmark to actually test uh, useful uh, use cases. Oh, okay. So uh, it's really for developing new machine learning algorithms to control the car and having a common platform to allow those algorithms to be tested. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, so, so TuneCar is basically an example how we're trying to uh, push for this effort of doing that. I have a sort of related question to the first question. So you said there could be more than like 10,000 parameters or 10,000 knobs. How do you create those relationships or that learning as to what impact one has even for your model? Like what's the process? Uh, so this is a black box optimization, which means that, that information is not necessary. Right, we don't need to know which parameter will change the dynamics, right? So we have a simulation where it takes in all these parameters and it just spit, basically spits out one number, which is the ob objective function that we're trying to minimize. So what happens in between, we don't really care. Um, I'll, I'll uh, go into more detail uh, okay. in, the, in the optimization process on how this works. Okay. Yeah, and again, just to add to what Billy mentioned, so we, we do use like some basic uh, learning algorithms within this approach. Mm -hmm. And then later on, we have a follow on work called Formula Zero, which is on dynamically, you know, identifying driving policies of other agents. So in a much more multi agent environment and then dynamically adjusting the safety versus progress uh, balance. Uh, so uh, and that uses a different kind of like, you know, reinforcement learning with self play. Uh, so the, the, I guess one point is that, you know, by integrating F110 with these uh, open AI gym components by having mm -hmm. our, our tool chains interfaceable with these uh, production grade components, we can <clears throat> actually have a lot of these machine learning algorithms as part of our <coughs> control and optimization tool chains. Got it. Okay. And so what Billy will show today is just one example. Uh, and there are <coughs> follow-on papers that have other examples. But uh, our aim here is just to say that, look, you can use this as a benchmarking sort of setup and run, you know, your own algorithms within that, whether it's for drones or for ground vehicles. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. Um, so next I'll... Um, go into some detail of our solution. Um, so the first step we did is basically we did system identification for creating the, the simulator. Uh, uh, basically, you know, uh, try we're trying to bridge the gap between simulation and reality. And one of the very basic things that you can do is have a good system identification. Um, so it's hard to get a really close approximate of these parameters, but 
it's better than not having done this step. So what we did was we measured basically the moment of inertia of our target hardware, um, also center of gravity, the uh, acceleration and deceleration capabilities, um, the corning stiffness coefficient, or basically a baseline of that, and also a surface friction coefficient of a given track. Um, once we've done that, we have a simulator. We can start, start um, going into our optimization, multi-parameter optimization process, right? So what this, uh, this, this component does is that it basically, it samples from a huge search space um, the trajectory, the car and controller parameters, and it to generate a population. So this is an evolutionary strategy based solution. And I'll go into more details later. Um, so basically it randomly samples to generate populations um, and it spawns multiple evaluation instances to basically get the objective function uh, of each of these uh, member in the population. All right. So once we go into each instance, it also finds the optimal velocity profile for a given race line uh, by solving a convex problem. Um, and then it, it sends the corresponding physical and controller parameters and the trajectory that the car needs to travel on to our simulator. So each of these instances will have its own simulator um, with its own parameters running independently. Right? Once you get uh, into the simulator, you evaluate basically the lap time for each of these instances, and then you track the sample trajectory with the controller parameter to get a lap time. Uh, and you send it back to the multi-parameter optimization where um, so each generation will have multiple simulations running in, in parallel and then the multi-parameter optimization collect all the results from the, from the, from the simulators um, and we do this iteratively with uh, multiple generations. Um, and once the lab time or um, We'll talk about how we model the, the covariance or, or the spread basically in the sample space. Um, once the population converges to a good solution, we basically move on and take that solution and put it on a real car, a real track, and we do validation. Um, all right, now we're going to go into more detail of how we actually implemented this tool chain. Um, so basically, TunerCar, we, uh, we formulated this problem so that it optimizes a parameterized version of the racing strategy or the race line, um, the controller, and the vehicle dynamics. Um, as I said before, the objective function um, of this problem is uh, very straightforward. Uh, so mathematically, we define the objective function as a lap time where it's basically a function that maps from the end dimension of your search space to a real number. Um, the search space is parameterized by theta, which is the, basically the concatenation of the three components, uh, vehicle dynamics, racing strategy, and controller. Uh, and we'll, next, we'll go into details on uh, what the search space looks like. Uh, so first of all, the thing, uh, the, the biggest part of our search space is the nominal race line. Um, so there are a few requirements for parameterizing the race line. Um, so first of all, it should be easily sampled, which means that it probably should be a vector of real numbers with uh, upper and lower bound on each element of the vector so that you can randomly sample a vector very easily and you can control the sampling uh, scheme. It also should allow for good coverage, sometimes the full or close to full coverage based depending on the shape of your track because um, we don't want to accidentally miss out on a good race line. And it should be easy to check for boundary violation. What I mean by that is uh, it should be easy to check if your race line is going into the wall of the track. Um, so what we did is, first of all, we basically divided up the drivable surface of a different track into equal size rectangular boxes, as you see in the figure here, right? So we're covering the track with all these uh, rectangular boxes to cover as much surface as possible. So you can see there's some overlap. 
of these boxes. Uh, and we zoom in, for example, it'll turn, it looks like this. Um, so how we sample for a nominal race line is that after all the boxes are drawn, we basically sample a 2D point uh, inside each of the boxes, right? So one point for one box, and um, we keep track of all the transformations, basically the frame transforms from all the boxes to our map frame, and then we're sampling basically in the boxes frame. Um, so these rectangular boxes, we know the width and the height of the boxes. Uh, so it provides us with an upper bound and lower bound on what the X and Y coordinate value of each of these uh, single 2D points could be. Um, so a race line could be sampled by sampling, uh, if we have N boxes, we'll sample N points. Um, so for with both X and Y, this basically means that we have a R to the 2N sized vector that divine, defines the control points for the race line. Um, since we're covering the whole track uh, with boxes and basically the control points, you're, uh, it's not a guarantee, but it, it's a, it, it allows for good coverage to make sure that at least you're sampling control points inside the racetrack. And uh, hopefully it will cover, uh, the splines that it generates will cover most of the track a drivable surface, right? Also, um, since we're using a spline formulation here, it's very easy to get the coordinate of a single point on the trajectory or, or the nominal race line. It's really, and then it's really easy to check for boundary violation uh, to see if it uh, intersects with the uh, edges of the racetrack. Um, after all the all the points are drawn, we can basically form a spline uh, using these control points sample. So, for example, in the picture on the right here, we have all these yellow points, which are the sample points that are from the boxes. Um, and then we generate a spline going around the track using these points. Um, so the spline might or might not go through the control points uh, based on uh, what kind of formulation, formulation of spline that you use. So in Tunicar, we used a third order B-spline to create these splines. And uh, next, we're going to the next section of the search space, which is the physical parameters of the actual car. Um, we also search over physical parameters, um, specifically the ones that could be easily tuned on the fly. Uh, for example, the ones we did was uh, the overall mass of the vehicle. Um, we also search for the weight distribution. So basically, this th what, what this does is it's moving the center of gravity toward the front or the rear of the vehicle. Um, we also had two other parameters that are the front and rear cornering stiffness of the vehicle, where we changed the stiffness of the spring, or we could use different um, tire types. So this, uh, <coughs> oh, excuse me. this adds four extra dimension to the search space. Um, and then last, lastly, we are also searching over MPC and tracking uh, parameters that basically changes the behavior um, of the controller. So this adds three more dimensions to the search space, and I'll explain the, the graphic here. Um, basically, the approach we're using is a sampling-based trajectory generator for local planning. Um, so the first step of this process is basically sampling a bunch of goal pulses, as you can see in the blue uh, squares here. These are all g possible goal poses that you use to generate the trajectory. Um, and then all of these uh, cubic spirals are basically the generated trajectory. Um, oh, so sorry, a quick uh, clarification question. So when you say sampling points, do you mean you choose those are all the different points where you try to put the vehicle and see what happens to the trajectory? Uh, yeah, so this approach, so so the sampling scheme I'm using here is uh, basically a regular grid, right? So 
uh, you basically tr generate a trajectory for each of these points. I think some okay. of these are too far away for it to have a trajectory, but yeah, for each pose we have a trajectory. Okay. Um, so the first number, so, so there are two of these uh, uh, distances, look at distances that are involved in changing the behavior of these uh, trajectories. So the first one is the look at distance that controls um, how far along the racetrack that you're sampling these points around, right? So if you have a shorter look at distance for the trajectory generator, then your blue grids will shift back towards the car. And uh, if you have a bigger one, it will move along the track more to the left. Um, and then basically after you uh, sample and generate all these trajectories, we can see that I'm also checking the feasibility of these trajectories. Basically, the red ones are all ones with collision on uh, some point on the trajectory that it collides with the wall. So only the uh, the green one and the blue ones are feasible ones without collision. Um, so the after we select a trajectory that we want, uh, in this case, in tuna car, we used the least deviation from the nominal race line as our, our as our uh, basically the cost function to choose which trajectory to track. But in later work options. Um, and once you have a selected trajectory, you also need, uh, so the, the, the algorithm we use is Peer Pursuit, which is a ge geometric tracker. Uh, if you give it a trajectory, it basically converts that to steering input for the car, um, which means that you have to select a single point on the trajectory to track. So that's where the second look ahead distance comes in. Um, so this will also change the behavior of your car. Uh, as you imagine, if you have a bigger look ahead distance right along the trajectory, uh, you might preemptively steer more toward the uh, that point on the trajectory to get to that lateral position, right? So if you, uh, for example, if your car is over here and your look ahead point is already on the left, um, a larger look ahead distance will mean that you're cutting the corners of a racetrack more. Um, and lastly, we also uh, included a gain on the optimal velocity profile. So basically, we're also searching for if we can slightly increase the velocity profile or slightly decrease it uh, to see if we can sort of compensate for the discrepancy between the model that, that's used and the speed opt. Uh, I will talk about that a little bit later. So that's a off-the-shelf uh, convex problem solved. Uh, convex problem that solves for uh, 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 optimal velocity. So we're trying to compensate for the difference between the model that they use and the actual model that we have for the car. Um, so that concludes the whole search space. So we're searching over most of the things that uh, we can tune for these uh, 110 scale race cars uh, for this specific uh, model predictive control scheme. Um, so at the end, we're searching in around R to the 2n plus 7 dimensional space. So for some of the experiments that we're running, n is around 250 to 300. So this is like a 600, 500 to 600 dimensional vector that we're searching in. Um, and next, the velocity profile optimizer that I, that I mentioned is a off the shelf work done by Stephen Boyd. So basically given a spline or the XY points on your race line, uh, given the basic physical parameters, um, which is uh, the surface friction coefficient that we cannot tune, which is given by the track. And then the two other things that we could tune, the weight and weight distribution of your vehicle, um, you basically solve a convex optimization problem to solve for an optimal velocity profile along this race line. Uh, I won't go into details on this convex problem. Um, if you're interested, the paper is listed here. And lastly, we need to talk about uh, what is the evaluation criteria for, for this optimization process. Right. Um, since in this in this case, one car racing gives a very clear measure of quality, the lap time, 
as we mentioned before, we're going to use this as the evaluation criteria, and this is where the simulator will come into play. Um, we'll go into that uh, in a later section where we talk about the hardware and the simulator of the tool chain. Um, but the basic idea is that when the simulator re receives a new sample configuration, the parameters within the simulator is updated, uh, and then the sim simulation environment resets the car and then run the car to try to traverse the track. Um, and the result of each rollout is used to sort the populations into quantiles. Um, now that we have a very clear evaluation criteria, we can start looking into the gradient-free optimization um, that we use for tuner car. Um, our proposed optimization problem is high-dimensional non-convex, and it lacks a closed-form expression of the dynamics. As, we, uh, as I said before, this is a black box optimization where I don't really care how an input parameter change my uh, relationship with the dynamic model of the car and how it changes the behavior um, of the vehicle along the track. I only care about one thing, which is the lap time that the vehicle is able to achieve. Um, so this approach that we're using is based on evolution strategies. Um, basically, these are a type of optimization algorithms inspired by uh, natural selection. It was created in the early 90s, 60s, and 70s, I think. Um, uh, in the beginning, it was only used for like tabular RL problems where you can't really run any experiments on it, because it requires a lot of computational okay. power. Um, so nowadays, with the increase of computing power, it recently became very popular again in deep RL, uh, where if you have a problem that the gradient is not easily obtainable or the problem is non-convex, you can use these uh, ev evolution strategies as a bla black box optimization um, to solve your problem. So the intuition here with uh, ES is, is basically we can randomly generate an initial generation of the vector, so the vector that represents our search space that I mentioned before. Um, and then we have a lower and upper bound for each of the uh, element of the vector. And then once we start running the ES, uh, each generation, uh, we can evaluate each individual in the current generation using the fitness function or the evaluation criteria. And then after the evaluation of e each generation is finished, we only select the individuals that scored the highest from the current generation um, as the basis to form the next generation. Uh, so one of the really nice things about the, these evolution strategies is that these individual evaluations won't affect the score of another evaluation. So the individual evaluation of a single configuration in the same generation, they could be run in parallel. Uh, this will be very useful and by uh, creating basically a distributed computing model to run this problem. Um, the approach that we use here is called uh, CMA-ES, or Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolution Strategy. Um, it basically maintains the populations of your ES as a Gaussian distribution. Um, the mean and covariance matrix of the distribution are updated using top solutions after we evaluate each population. And to generate a new population, we basically um, sample the distribution to get another new vector and then do it over and over again to create a new generation. Um, so C uh, one of the nice things about CMAES is that it takes the evaluation result from the current generation, it adaptively increases or decreases the search space for the next generation, which means that it's basically trading off between exploration and exploitation without using any gradient information. Right? So for example, in the picture we're showing here, basically this is a toy toy problem in uh, 2D. And uh, so you have uh, basically two input parameters on two axes. And the color of the picture is basically your function value. And we're trying to find uh, the, so basically the, the, the wider points are either higher or lower. Uh, depends on your problem, uh, function values. And as you can see that each, each dot here is basically a member of your 
uh, pop, uh, generation or population. Um, so the distribution start out as a normal or, or a, was starts out with an initial covariance. So usually this is just the default uh, normal distribution. Um, and then it starts doing this exploration by blowing up the covariance matrix. Uh, as you can see, like the spread increases by a lot. Right, the spot, uh, the the spots are dots are basically spread across the whole uh, search space, right? And then once uh, you you've done this exploration step, um, and you start to see some very good solutions, you can see that the 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 distribution basically starts converging to the minimum by decreasing the covariance. Um, so that's the basic idea of the uh, optimization that we're using. Um, and as I mentioned before, the nature of CMA, yes, which is that the individual evaluation can, evaluations can happen in parallel. Um, this algorithm basically enables the use of a map reduced pattern, right? As we can see here, CMA, yes, is basically uh, the ventilator node that draws sample configurations, and then I distribute these evenly to all the workers each Worker will then simulate the proposed solution and then send only the score and sample index to the sink to update the mean and covariance of the distribution. Um, so basically, the communication overhead is also very small because you're uh, basically the most uh, communication happens when you are venting out these uh, configurations. Um, so basically, it sends out a, a, a high dimensional vector to each worker, but the worker runs their simulation uh, in isolation and basically only sends out uh, two floats back, the, a float and an index back to the CMA ES. So we can achieve this parallelization with uh, very little overhead. All right, so that was the optimization section. Um, next, we'll go over the target hardware of our tool chain and the design of the simulator. So I think we are at 1 p.m. Uh, so do you have more slides, or uh, we are we losing people as we speak? Okay, uh, maybe I'll skip to the results. Yeah, maybe we can uh, go a little bit. This is very interesting. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so maybe we can, you know, also follow up in a little bit more detail. Rahul, it seems like a very new. Um, a uh, new approach, and uh, I also wanted to see, you know, how it compares with your previous formal logic-based planning and so forth. So uh, maybe you can go to the results, and then we can do a deep, deeper dive. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is <laughs> yeah. Also, Nagin, you could yeah. share the the link to the Google Drive, uh, the Google Slides, with anybody in Intel Labs because. I think the videos don't show up really well. On right. I will post it. We usually post. And then is there a paper, Rahul, that you uh, submitted? Yeah, I sent you the okay. paper too. Yeah, that will yeah, be great. Yeah. So I will upload it uh, for our SharePoint. Uh, but yeah, maybe we can uh, quickly go over the results. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so this is how we basically determine when to uh, stop uh, terminate the optimization. So the termination threshold we chose is the basically the L2 norm of the covariance matrix that we saw in CMA. Yes, uh, basically how spread out your uh, population members are. So as you can see, the termination threshold we choose is very conservative. Basically, after say 15, uh, 20 generations, the lap time is not lowering. The uh, lap time, which is the dashed line, uh, is not lowering anymore. So uh, yeah. And then next, we'll we basically for um, for the CMA yes we invent, also investigated the effect of uh, changing these hyperparameter for the parameters for the uh, optimization. So basically, there are only two hyperparameters that are very crucial to getting good results, uh, which are the population size, basically how many members you have in each each generation, and also the survival percentile, right? The survival of the fittest. We're basically selecting, say, like the top 10% to keep, and then form the new generation. Um, so as we can see, the trend here is that basically a bigger population size will basically uh, promote more exploration. 
and as a result, you'll have a way longer, conver uh, way slower convergence rate and uh, better results in terms of the best lab time that you can achieve, where you can see the difference in, uh, say, like a thousand population size versus 10,000 is around almost two seconds. For like a 15 second lab, that's a lot. Um, and then we also investigated the uh, effect of the survival percentile. So uh, having a higher percentile that you keep after each generation also promotes more exploration. Uh, so it has this basically the same effect of having a larger population size, where in general, you'll run, run more generations to converge and your results will be uh, better. And then we also compare to just doing naive random search to prove that, because CMAES is uh, kind of like a guided random search. Uh, we just want to show that it's it's guided, it's not completely random, and we improve over for over uh, 15 seconds uh, compared to a naive random, random sampling. So uh, how long does it take you to uh, do this? Uh, I mean, is it like days of simulation or it's... Uh... Uh, so it's around eight to ten hours for one uh, experiment. For one sort of plan to generate for one environment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. So this is running on. Uh, this was running on one instance of the ninety-six core machine, basically. Mm -hmm. So this uh, Rahul is different. I guess you'll talk to it, right? Previously, you had this fly learning to fly. Uh, which is also using re reinforcement learning, but it had this uh, safety constraint as part of the optimization. So this, you're taking a totally different uh, methodology uh, because sort of like a more narrower problem or? Uh, no, I think, I, I mean, the, the general issues with all of these problems are that they are too hard to solve online. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so you develop <clears> this <throat> simulator. Uh -huh. Go ahead. No, so how can we use like, learning approaches to uh, to provide safety guarantees and maximize performance in this case over here uh, but in an online manner right so using so that uses some of these learning based approaches uh, so learning to fly is very different from this one because that has like formal semantics in formulating the problem and mm -hmm. it's like uh, correct by construction kind of safety over there uh, but it still has this probabilistic aspect. Uh, but in this case, uh, as Billy will show in the next slides, is that through the pipeline, we are actually eliminating the unsafe uh, driving scenarios. The crashes are happening virtually before we actually put yeah. the car back on the ground. And then the, 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 the pipeline is very well tuned to bridge this sim to real gap. So basically, all you have to do now <clears throat> is scan the racetrack once, run everything into a car and then put the car on the floor and then it will race the fastest. Without any of this safety guarantees that you had in your previous formulation uh, because you already eliminated, like you don't uh, use that as an optimization framework anymore. And is that the direction you guys want to go? In? Well, it's not necessarily a, a, like a general direction. I, I think mm -hmm. you'll see the next time we present, we'll talk about a very a different way of providing safety guarantees for learning based uh, mm -hmm. algorithms. Okay. But in this case, uh, we are eliminating the unsafe uh, uh, trajectories that are generated uh, in, in the simulator. Okay. And uh, so, so that, that, that is causing us to do this pruning, uh, you know, in the offline manner. Yeah, so the, the, the only downside I, I think we, which we could approve on is having like a formal verification of safety. And basically, we're just saying that, okay, it didn't happen in a simulation. Maybe it won't happen in real life. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so as you can see, like, as we said, we're trying to correct for infeasible strategy. So, like, the deep green one is the spline that you actually sampled, but the one that you chose is actually the light green one. So it's not uh, completely following the track, uh, the nominal race line, right? As you can see in, in simulation, this, this dark green race line was able to get past because maybe the car sizes are different. So this gets way too close to the wall. Uh, a small, small, like a, a deviation in the mapped environment and the size of your car could mean that it crashes and 
real life, but it doesn't crash in simulation. So that's what the NPC is all about, right? To correct for infeasible strategies. Um, I think lastly, so this is basically showing that uh, the, the same story here, right? It's the, the dotted are the real tracked trajectories on the car. As you can see, it's trying to get away from the corner instead of going straight at the corner. Um, so, so, so what we see, at least in performance, in terms of lap time, that it's actually surprisingly better than what we thought was going to happen. So the lap time in Sim and in Real are very close. Um, so for track B, it was less close because we didn't, in hindsight, we should have done it, but we didn't redo the uh, the surface co uh, friction coefficient on the new track, which also changes the behavior by a lot. Um, but what we generally see is that it beats the expert solutions. So these expert solutions are from, uh, for Philadelphia tracks, are from the class, which is a the graduate course that we were teaching. Um, and then we also show the solution in some of these real world tracks in simulation, right? So we uh, gather these solutions from teams all around the world. We implement them in simulation and we compare uh, performance of Tuna, tuna Car um, on these two real world track and we show that it's still beating the experts or the winning solutions for that certain race, right? It's it's like a one, one second difference uh, on an eight second, nine second track, which is a lot. And uh, so as Rahul said, so for future work, uh, we'll try to apply tuner car to multiple multi-vehicle scenarios. Uh, the local planner is already uh, capable of addressing, avoiding, or overtaking the other car. But we took it, it's it still has this uh, population-based idea behind it. It's a slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, approach that we took. Uh, maybe we can also send that uh, send that paper to. Oh yeah, it's I listed the the citation here. But basically, we moved on to two-car racing scenario. Uh, we call it Formula Zero. Basically, you're starting from zero and you're synthetically creating these uh, expert, uh, quote-unquote, expert solutions in simulation that you're trying to race against. And then online, you're basically uh, solving a multi-arm bandit problem to try to identify who the other car is. Um, and then, uh, as always, we validate the solution on real hardware. So these are solutions found in uh, simulation, a side by side comparison. The results are, uh, so we didn't really compare the lap time here because in multi-car racing, the objective is slightly different. Uh, you don't care about lap time as much. You care about actually beating the other guy. So as long as you beat the other guy, even if you have a lower lap time, you, you still win. Um, so what we did was we compare like the regret uh, in the multi-arm bandit problem, um, and then we see that it's actually, although it's slightly different by where the the, the uh, convergence is slower than in simulation, but we're still uh, getting closer results. So yeah, if you want more details, the paper is listed here. This is uh, the work we recently submitted for ICML. Uh, that's it. All right. Thank you very much. This was very, very comprehensive and, you know, seems like very, very interesting work. Uh, so questions, I guess we've lost a few people, but uh, people uh -huh. have questions. All right. So Rahul, we'll follow up in detail. I'll post this material and share it. And then, you know, we might, uh, you know, uh, ask you for more questions and so forth. Uh, sure. All right. Thank you. Follow up. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank I mean, this was very, very nice. Thank you very much, Billy. It's nice all to right, meet you. Thank you. you. Thanks for the great work. Nice to meet you too. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Bye bye.